Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Groundhog Day. Welcome to another exciting edition of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, but before we do, I thought I'd get a quick shout out to some of our classrooms who are joining us. So we have Mrs. Ganato's class in Hi, Illinois, Mount Prospect. You guys want to say hi? <laughs> they are. <laughs> We have Mrs. Marabelli's class. Let me turn their mic on. They can say hi. <laughs> We've got uh, Mrs. Dwarf's grade eights are joining us today from Taylorville, Illinois. Say hi, guys. <laughs> All right. Grade twos from Florida, Mrs. Stouffer's class. Hi. Awesome. Great to see you. Good hi, too. And then from Kansas, we have Mrs. Warren's group joining us. Say hi, everybody. Hi. All right. Well, great to see everybody. Uh, let me introduce our guest today. So excited to have uh, Kenny joining us today. So um, Kenny Broad, he's an environmental anthropologist. So he studies uh, relationships between humans and our environment. Um, he's led tons of scientific and filmmaking expeditions on every continent and they're usually pretty extreme, deep caves and things like that. Uh, in 2011, along with uh, one of his colleagues, he was named the National Geographic's uh, Explorers of the Year, and that was for his effort documenting blue holes in Bahama. Um, so, Kenny, I'm going to let you take over because you've got all the good stuff today. How are you doing? All right. Hello, everybody. And I guess you're all muted, so I'm assuming I can't hear you screaming, laughing, and having fun. So I was going to take some time and talk about one of the places on our planet that we know really, really nothing about. And one of the reasons I want to share this with you, it's as, as you get older, some of you are already old enough, it's a place that you can explore and make big contributions, not just to different parts of science, but actually to figuring out where our drinking water is. And that's underwater caves. So what in some parts of the world they call cenotes in Mexico or sinkholes in the U.S. And where I work sometimes in the Bahamas, they're called blue holes. So I'm going to try to pull up and just talk through uh, some pictures and some videos and try to explain this stuff. But... What, what we don't think about is really if you take away the water on Earth that's locked up in ice, more than 95%, so that's almost all our fresh water is beneath our feet. We see beautiful rivers and giant lakes, but really that's only a tiny, tiny bit of our water. And the problem is we don't pay attention to what we throw on the ground or what actually might... Um, we might be putting on purpose underground, and that can end up in our drinking water. And that's water that might be thousands and thousands of years old. And because all the water that we have here on Earth, it actually got trapped, and a lot of it is actually came out of the rocks. But we can't make new water. We can only move it around, so we have to be careful of, of the little bit of water that we have. So let me try to share my screen. And let's see, desktop. Start screen share. Are you able to hear me, Joe? Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. Uh, it looks good so far. I can see me. That's a good start. <laughs> okay. Now, you, tell me if the screen goes black. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Well, that is exactly what a picture of an underwater cave looks like. Hmm. It's exact. It's pitch black. I took that picture myself. But this is what it looks like with two divers. That's my friend Brian and I dropping down from, you see the hole up to the sky, we're dropping down almost 300, 350 feet deep into a cave. And so we're actually about to go swimming in people's drinking water. And sometimes you can get into these caves in the middle of a forest, so that's in a pine forest in the Caribbean and one of the Bahamian Islands. That's the deepest known ocean hole in the world. That's 663 feet deep. Now, let's see. Oh, there's my friend William Truebridge. He's a very famous free diver. That means he can hold his breath for actually several minutes, and he's sitting at the bottom of one of these holes. And actually, that's not nearly the bottom. That's about 90 feet deep. And look, he has no mask, no fins, no snorkel. He's just calmly sitting there. So... 
next time you're in class, if you feel like holding your breath, you can time how long you hold your breath. Maybe you guys can do it. We can do it after we do my presentation. We'll see how everyone does. Um, so how do these things form? Well, when water, like rainfall, it goes through the air and it picks up a little bit of carbon dioxide. Some of, the, some of you may have heard of greenhouse gases. One of the big greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. And it makes the water slightly acidic. And when it hits the ground in a lot of parts of the world that have limestone, it actually eats away at the limestone and it forms these reservoirs underground, underwater, uh, underneath our feet. And that's where the fresh water is. But the salt water from the ocean can actually move through the rocks. It's limestone is like we're living on a sponge, and the water comes underneath. And where the salt water and fresh water meet, that's where the caves form. So I have that's what it would look like if we did a cross section or cut through the earth and saw one of the openings to these caves. And in these caves, we can study what some of the earliest forms of life, what we call microbes, bacteria. Everyone says, wash your hands, you know, get the bacteria off. Well, bacteria are good. If it wasn't for bacteria, we wouldn't even have oxygen on Earth. And that's what the earliest forms of life. And we think some of the earliest forms of life are in these blue holes, these caves, where you have fresh water and oxygen. You have the heavier salt water beneath it. You have trees and animals that fall in there, and that's food for bacteria. And the bacteria eat that, and then there's a chemistry that happens, and there's a poisonous gas. Well, it's poisonous for us that come into one layer of this blue hole, but it's what the bacteria like to live in. And it also makes it a very good place to study fossils, and I'll show you a bunch of pictures. And the other thing we study is stalagmites. Those are cave formations that formed when sea level was much lower. So if we went back 20,000 years ago, the sea level around many parts of the world was almost 400 feet lower. That's a 40-story building. So we talk about the ice ages, and I bet lots of you have seen the show Ice Ages. Well, that, that actually happens. So we go in and out of these different periods of cold and, and hot. So a lot of what uh, the work I'm talking about was in a magazine, National Geographic, so I'm sure Joe can uh, let you all know how to get a copy if you want to read more about it. But And we worked in an area in the Bahamas, and I live right near the Bahamas in the state of Florida, so go Florida. I know we have another Florida group there. And we had a big team of um, people from the Bahamas, of hydrologists, of geologists, of... Um, microbiologist. We even had my friend Jennifer McAlady. She's an astrobiologist. She studies life on other planets, but she looks at the blue holes, the caves, to try to see if there's forms of life in our caves that might be what what the life in these outer um, in our parts of our solar system, what we call extremophile forms of life. And I don't know if you can see the photographer. He's the one with the, uh, he's wearing a red hat, kneeling down on the left side of the screen. He was my teacher, Wes Skiles. He taught me about cave diving and photography and doing science underwater. And I have a video about Wes, who, who unfortunately, he passed away um, about three or four years ago. But here's a video, and so you can turn up the sound. Oh, here's another picture, Wes. Sorry, and here's the video. Back and below. Renowned photographer Wes Skiles heads up a film crew who will deliver images to document the scientific finds. I'm the eyes of the scientists and the explorers. I know that what I'm shooting is bringing this back to be shared in very important ways, and that's thrilling. <laughs> Losing blue holes is hard to contemplate for the explorers who have touched the depths of this lethal and alluring lost world. You know, I'm not sure I would know how to go on in life if I wasn't able to go to my church underwater. We go down in these places and we're cleansed. When we come up from a dive, 
pressure, the challenges, the difficulties, the conflicts, they're gone. We come up from a dive and it is like you're reborn. So that was my teacher, Wes. So we often think about cave diving as very dangerous, but you know, a lot of the big problems we have are sometimes just on our way to the cave site. So here's, we had a, a car accident on the highway on the way there. Luckily, no one was hurt. Everyone was wearing their seatbelts. But sometimes we think about the dangerous things, and we forget about the things we do every day. So that's one thing you have to remember is always pay attention to the simple things because in, on expeditions, it's usually the simple things that get us. This is, to find some caves, we sometimes rappel down. I, I don't know if you, can you see the person rappelling down into the hole? Yep. That was back in Mexico in one of the deepest caves in the world. So some of these places, you don't even start diving until you get way down underground. Here you can see, and there's rivers underwater. You're climbing on different rocks. Sometimes you even take uh, floats down there because you have to float down some of these rivers and you're on ropes and you even end up living underground. So there we're sleeping on hammocks and that's where we start our diving. So I'm going to skip over some of this. We also, so I, I also will fly, I'm a, a pilot, so I'll fly in helicopters or go on boats and we'll find holes and then we have to We'll find our way through the jungle, so we use GPS to mark what we found, and then we might take two or three days to get to the spot, and then we rappel down. So rappelling is using ropes, dropping the equipment down, and getting into these caves. And you never know when you're looking at them how far they go. We spend a lot of time with people who live in the communities talking about where they get their water, because in the old days, everyone got their water from these holes. But now it comes out of a tap, and a lot of people forget that the water's underground. So some of these places end up getting a lot of pollution. I'll show you. And we go through swamps, and you find holes in the limestone that have crystal clear water. Sometimes we'll just dive in them, just holding our breath to see if the caves go anywhere before we come back with lots and lots of gear. Sometimes we can get lucky, and we just pull our cars up, and we, we jump in there. But other times we can't even go diving because that's almost a quarter mile of garbage that's filling up a hole. And that's the problem. People don't realize when we put the garbage in those holes, it's getting right into our drinking water. And that's me almost a thousand feet back, so three football fields back swimming over piles of garbage. Sometimes you just have to stick your head, that's my bald head there, stick your head in. Stick your head in, stick your head in some more, and make sure that your buddy's holding your foot. That's my friend Brian Kaycook, who I love to dive with because he's, he's the safest diver around. But when you get in there, those are the mangroves. So those are plants that grow on the coast, and we start off in the ocean. We swim under with 60 feet of, of peat of mud where the mangrove roots come down and get their nutrients and then we keep going all the way through till we get into fresh water. So we've got the ocean connected to the inland. So whatever you put on the ground inside in the land can make its way out to the ocean and, and vice versa. Sometimes sharks like to stay in the ocean holes because there's strong currents so they don't have to move around to get oxygen over their gills. And sometimes you'll see them lined up and you just kind of lift them up and move them out of the way. You make your dive into the cave and then you come back out and you move them out of the way and they never bother you. So sharks are actually a good sign that I feel safe when I see the sharks around. Never, ever, ever go into a cave, especially an underwater cave, without the right kind of equipment. So I'll show you a video and describe some of the special equipment that we use. This is from about 20 years ago with um, my friend Woody Jasper and Wes Skiles shot this footage. And back then, we had to make all our own diving equipment, and we wear our tanks on our side, and you only use a little bit of your gas, your diving gas for going in, a little bit for coming out, and you save a lot for emergencies. You also have two, three, probably five lights just in case one goes wrong, you will always want backup light. 
you always run a continuous line. So a line from the surface, the daylight all the way into the cave. You never go into a cave without the the line. You take a backup mass, backup fin straps. You have different sources of diving gas in case one of them breaks down. So it's all about controlling your breathing, going slowly, slowly. So it took lots of dives to go just a little bit of distance in this. And you can see this is one of the, the scariest or tightest caves you can go in. So this was a long time ago. And you can see the guideline right there. You all are still hearing me okay, right, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. The videos are playing great as well. Okay, great. And here you can see when you get to a tight hole, we call it a restriction. And the reason you want to save a lot of your gas in your tank is sometimes you might go into crystal clear water, but coming out, it, the visibility is not clear. So you'll see in a minute what happens when my friend Wes stirs up the, the bottom a little bit. Boom, you can't even see a strong light right in front of your face. And that's Wes at decompression. I'm going to move through, but most of the caves can are big and beautiful. And remember, they're pitch black, but we bring strong lights with us. And you're really swimming through the ice ages, coming up from 20 feet all the way up, seeing what might be millions of years of rocks and geology all around you. And there's beautiful crystals that form, and those are our bubbles, <clears throat> sometimes get trapped on the ceiling. You might go into a room that's the size of a football stadium that's all crystals. And that's a picture, I think I saw it up in Joe, the background in, in Joe's classroom. Yeah, right absolutely. There. And you can see it here, there's one, two, three, four of us diving in this room that's just not far at all from the surface, even not even far at all from a road that everyone drives over every day. So let me show you some of the creatures that lived in these these holes, what we think were like the ancient oceans. So we go and we take scientific equipment. That's a blind cave fish called Lucifuga that a marine biologist named Tom Iliff from Texas He's found many, many new species exploring underwater caves, and there's lots more for, for you all to find. Look, there's an animal, a crustacean, that doesn't have any uh, skin pigments, no colors. You can even see part of its, its body inside, like this shrimp. And look, that while the other animal didn't have an eye, this one has an eyeball, but it has no optic nerve, so it actually can't see. And we think that it used to live in the ocean, but then it moved into in what we call evolved in a cave ecosystem. This is a tiny little creature, but it actually has venomous fangs, so it can eat some of these other creatures. And I have a video of, oop, there's a close-up. And here should play. Here's a video of collecting some of this stuff underground. And there we take little test tubes, and you can barely see the creatures in there. The ones that we're filming here are some of the big ones, and we might do this in really deep water. And we use machines called rebreathers, so we can actually. When we breathe out, we catch that and we take out the carbon dioxide and we put oxygen and helium and that's how we can stay underwater for long periods of time. Ooh, that one's hard to get. That one's hard to get. Ah, ah, got it. And that's what it looks like under the microscope. And that's in some very deep water where we're taking samples of, remember I, I mentioned the microbes? Well, they live in the pitch black under the hydrogen sulfide poisonous layer. And what we do, we take them up to the laboratory, or little samples where my friend Jennifer, she studies them. And the divers, the explorers, can talk to the scientists. And she can tell us, okay, go get some more of these type of samples. And she directs us on what to do. Oh, there's a layer of the hydrogen sulfide. 
and then you can see we dive through and we try not to spend too much time in it. Oops, let me just check. Sorry, something. Oops. And it's about 10 feet thick and it starts at 30 feet deep. And boom, we try to move fat through it as fast as we can. And well, this is what I used to look like when I started diving in there. And now you saw my ugly bald head now. So I'm going to skip over this, but this just talks about how the origin of our Earth is, we think, four and a half billion years ago. And it's only in the last two and a half billion years that we've even had oxygen, that, um, that we've had oxygen on Earth. And we can thank the bacteria, particularly the what we call blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria, because when they breathe out, they actually breathe out oxygen. And so there's that much bacteria that it provided oxygen, and that's where plants and animals, and finally at the very end came the humans. So let me show you some of these fossils we found. That's an ancient owl roost, and just from what the owl ate, and owls can't digest the bones, they have to throw up the bones, we found all sorts of birds and snakes and lizards, and we also found new species of tortoises with my friend Nancy Albury, who she's a paleontologist, and David Stedman. They're all they study these ancient bones, and I can bring up a tiny little bone, and they can tell you what kind of bird it it is. And we found new species in there, so all sorts of things to find. That's actually 4,000 year old crocodile coprolite. A coprolite is a fancy word for poop. So that's 4,000 year old poop from a crocodile. So there were giant crocodiles that lived down there and there's no more crocodiles in that part of the world. And there's even ancient Indian remains. So those are Paleo-Indians, what we call people who lived there about, well we think about a thousand, fourteen hundred years ago and they disappeared. So part of the question is why, why did some of the animals and people disappear? So there's lots more questions than there are of answers. There's also whirlpools. That's out in the ocean. I'm going to show you a video from, oh, about, that was about 20 years ago where we found this hole. And you can see the water boiling up. And you, the fish can't even swim against it. But watch what happens when the tide changes. Zoom. It starts to pull the water down and it makes a whirlpool. And we were releasing a, a dye, so that's some, a, a kind of dye that's not toxic for the environment, and that's how we study where the water goes and what other holes it comes out on. And I accidentally got sucked in it while I was taking pictures, and you can see I was just holding my breath, and it starts to pull me down, and then pulls me down, and no matter what, you have to remember not to panic. So anything you do, if you're ever about to take a test and your heart's racing or maybe you're breathing hard or you're getting nervous about something, just stop and relax. Take some slow breaths. In diving we call them sanity breaths. So in this case I had to stop kicking and I couldn't take any breaths because I was holding my breath but I just slowly pulled myself out. Arr and boom, made it luckily to the surface. So let me just finish up with showing you, these are the stalagmites that we study in the laboratory and we take samples and we try to take just a few, the fewest number of samples we need and then they come back to the laboratory where we use chemicals to figure out how old they are and also we can figure out what the rain was like and the temperature was like hundreds of thousands of years ago. So that's how we know how the climate has changed in the past. We also study the, that's actually dust that comes all the way from Africa. Here's a picture of a, from a satellite of dust coming all the way from Africa across the ocean and it ends up being washed into some of the caves. And what it tells us is the climate has changed very rapidly, so sometimes in less than 10 years from very cold to very warm conditions. So it's another reason why we have to be very careful with 
with climate change and global warming. And I think I have one more video. So in these caves, the way we communicate with each other, we, we don't use those masks that you just saw very often. We mostly use hand signals, just like uh, sign language, and, or we use light signals where we'll shine the light in certain ways. And in some cases, we when you can't see anything, we use touch signals. So squeeze means stop. If you push someone's leg forward, it means go. If you pull them backwards, backwards. If you cross your legs, it might mean push me. If you um, put them back and forth, it might mean pull me. So there's all there's a whole other language for being in the dark and underwater. And I have an uh, eight-year-old and a twelve-year-old, two boys. That so we use some of these same sign languages uh, for talking when we can't hear each other across the street or when we don't want to make noise. So you guys can practice that in class. But you just never know what's around the corner. It's like exploring inner space. And it really does feel like you're on another planet. So I think I will end. I think I might have. Yep, that's the last slide. So, um, Joe, you can tell me what to do. Should I go back to the other screen and I can try to? I don't know if we have time for answering questions, or you tell me what to do. Yeah, absolutely. We have time for questions. If you go back to that little green button again, the share screen, and push it, you'll come back. It'll shut down the share screen. You'll come back. Uh, let's see. Am I back? You're back. Well, All right. Kenny, thanks so much. That was phenomenal. Just an amazing look at, I'm sure, a part of the planet that most of the students joining today haven't even contemplated before. So that's just phenomenal. Thanks so much. No, it was fun. And I've been looking forward to this for a while because, as you did notice, I do have the picture back here. And I was actually, maybe about a month ago, two months ago, connected with Tierney Tees. And she saw the picture right away and said, do you want me to reach out to, oh, to Kenny? He's in this picture. And I was like, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love Tierney. She's a great explorer. Yeah. So uh, if you're up for some questions, we'll start reaching out to the classroom. So. Sure. Uh, let's start off, Mrs. Gonatos. Let's grab a couple questions. They're in Mount Prospect, Illinois. Hey. Hi there. Thanks so much. That was so cool. My kids All are right. loving it. I'm loving it. You're awesome. This is um, Jessica. It's her birthday today. So. Hey, happy birthday, Jessica. Happy question birthday. Birthday. Groundhog Day birthday. <laughs> okay, so what is your research, research pro process? Like, how do you pick location sites, and why do you choose that location? Oh, that's a great, great question. So depending on what we're looking for, so for example, if it's fossils, we look for areas that have been scoured, for example, by hurricanes. So many coastal areas, they're very low. So there's not a lot of archaeological or paleontological sites that are on land because of all the hurricanes. But that means that if you can find a cave there, that's probably where you'll find fossils in these areas. So if you can think about these caves almost as time capsules for everything from what kind of animals and maybe even people that live there, but also these different sorts of creatures that we don't know whether they existed because we know they won't exist on land. So really almost every cave we learn something new about because we've spent so little time in them. That's why I'm telling you there's there's lots and lots to explore underground. Awesome. Let's snake one more before we visit another class. Hurry up. Choose one that you were interested in. 
Go ahead, have a seat. Um, maybe what's your work experience, any training, you know, how do you go, oh, do the one, how do you go from, yeah, good one. Okay, let's listen, let's take a one, go ahead. Um, my question is, how do you go from something you wanted to do to actually wanting to do it? Like, wow, like, that's a great question. So, when I, how old are you? About how old are you, is your class? Eleven. Eleven. When, when, when I was eleven years old was the first time that I got to try scuba diving because my neighbor was a diver. And the first time I tried it, I knew that all I wanted to do was spend time in the ocean. So after that, any time I could try to get a ride or ride my bicycle near the ocean, I would, I would either get in it or even just watch fish and animals. And then I started volunteering. There are all different sorts of ways to volunteer for different science projects or an aquarium or something like that. And then I started getting paid to do what some people may say are silly jobs. So when people would drop something into the water, I would get paid to go find it for them, or even picking up golf balls that people hit into the water on golf courses. I and some people even would run golf carts into the water, and I would get paid to pick them up. So I did anything I could to be able to practice scuba diving, and then I would save money, or my parents for my birthday would let me take uh, buy a piece of equipment, and eventually it turned into a job. And then I realized, though, that I needed more school, so I would go back to school while I was working. And then finally, I got to a point in school where they paid for the school. So now I get to work for a university, and I get paid to go diving and look for new creatures. Very cool. That's, that doesn't sound too bad at all. <laughs> for, some, for some reason, they don't pay grade 7 teachers to do that. <laughs> Uh, let's visit Mrs. Marabelli's classroom in Thunder Bay, Ontario, in Canada. Thank you very much again. We have three questions. Go ahead. All right. Okay. My question to you is, what is the most beautiful cave you've ever explored and where is it located? That's, a, that's too hard a question. Okay, I'm going to answer. <laughs> I'm going to answer the, the way that I heard my friend who's a famous underwater explorer named Bob Ballard. My favorite cave is the next one that I'm going to be going in because I just can't choose. I really can't. They're all beautiful in different ways and the ones that are that are full of crazy weird bacteria, those are beautiful, but then the ones that have all the cave formations, the the stalagmites, they're beautiful. You no more hard questions like that. <laughs> here we have another one here. Um, are you af are you afraid when you go on these missions? Well, the main thing is to always be honest with yourself. So if you feel like you shouldn't be there, and sometimes I've been in a cave where I've been a hundred times, and something doesn't feel right that day. So if I don't feel comfortable, then I decide I'm getting out of here, and or I don't even go in. I may not even get out of the car if I'm not feeling right that day. So like anything, don't let anyone pressure you into doing something that if you think it's not right, don't do it. So I try not to get to a point where I'm scared. I'll chicken out much earlier than getting scared. <laughs> okay, sorry. The last question. In all of the world, what was your favorite spot to dive? Are you guys teaming up against me, asking me the hard questions? A little bit. A little yeah. bit. Okay. <laughs> In all the world, my favorite. I would say my own home of Miami because now I can go diving in the same places I went when I was a little kid with my, my children who are 8 and 12 years old. So I, I'd say back in Miami. Although I've never been diving. Have I been diving in Canada? I've never been diving in Canada. And you have a very famous uh, Canadian cave diver who is my good friend Jill Heinerth. You should get her to talk about some of the diving in Canada on one of your shows. We have had Jill. Jill was oh. a guest in um, October. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank All you. right. Great, great questions. Um, let's go to Florida and visit our grade twos. I bet you they have a couple questions. Hi, my name is Liana. What are some things you can do when you're in danger? 
That's a really good question. One of the things to do when you're in danger is to make sure that, well, if you're in, in danger underwater, you just have to stay calm. I close my eyes and take two or three slow breaths, and then you have to use your brain because your body wants to breathe hard, your body wants to kick hard, your body wants to all of a sudden start to freak out. But does anyone get nervous when they're taking a test sometimes? Any of you? Yeah. How about playing sports? No. How about if you did something wrong at home and you're worried about mom or dad coming home and getting in trouble? Yeah. 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 Well, the best thing to do besides telling them the truth is to take nice slow breaths and just try to explain and apologize. It's the same thing underwater. You just go nice and slow. Do everything slow because if you rush into something, then it gets you in more trouble. We have another one, Violet. <laughs> so you know. Hi, my name is Violet. Where have you dived? Are the caves different in each place? Hi, Violet. That's a great question. Yes, the caves are very different in, because some places have different geology. Geology is the kind of rocks. So there are caves actually that are limestone, but some of them are up in mountains. So you might have to go mountain climbing and then go back down into the cave. Other places you just you take a boat and you have to dive underwater to get to the cave. So they're very different types of caves, and that's one of the great things is you never know what the new cave that you're going to find is going to be like. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's steal one more from your class. Hi, my name is Madison. How deep can a person dive? Oh, that's a really great question, Madison. Well, there's certain kinds of diving machines and clothes that you can wear where you can go more than a thousand feet underwater. A thousand feet. So imagine that, how many stories of a building that is. So in at that depth, it's actually, you could be out in the ocean, but there's really no light or almost no light. So you can get way down there. And there's lots of good jobs and exciting things you can do diving. The main thing is just to take your time. The first thing is how many of you, you all better know how to swim or I'm going to come there and, and get mad at you because Floridians, we got water all around us. So make sure if you don't know how to swim, Go home and tell your parents you want to learn. All right. Great group of questions, too. Let's give last couple questions to our class from Illinois, our grade eights. Your mic is on. You got a couple? You can go up there. <laughs> Kevin. Green light camera, so that's what we need. And talk loud. <laughs> what were your motivations to do this? Like whenever you like what what motivated you to do it at all? I guess it for me there was just another world. So once I got I saw that there's there's this other world that was really just not far away because there's water everywhere and I got in there and it's I'd like to give you a bunch of really good reasons, but it just feels like you're sometimes escaping onto another planet. It's quiet. If you're snorkeling, there's there's no cell phones, there's no email. You you've escaped to another planet, but we're still here on Earth. Okay, we got another one. When you said the uh, sharks are a good sign, does that is there like a reason? Like, yeah, that's a good question. I didn't explain it very well. Um, the sign of a healthy marine ecosystem is to have top predators, and one of the top predators are sharks. So that's why when you see a lot of sharks around, it usually means that you have you have a great, uh, a, a fairly healthy system. Okay, I think that's it from Taylorville. We don't have any other questions right now. All Stay right. warm over there. It's slowly, slowly. All right. Well, Kenny, again, I mean, I can't thank you enough. That was just phenomenal. Start to finish, a great little peek into your everyday and 
speaking for myself, it makes me a little bit jealous. I mean, I have a lot of fun teaching, but getting into some of those systems, and I know you get the chance to teach as well. So that's what you were doing just before this call, I think. Yeah, and I, it may sound better than it is because we spend a lot of our time uh, writing grant proposals and reading papers and then writing up what we find. So I wish I was in the field more. So I wish I was diving every day. <laughs> All right. Well, again, thanks for a peek into a world that I'm sure most students have uh, maybe only seen in the occasional picture from time to time. Um, I will pass on to the teachers a couple more links uh, to a few oh, YouTube videos so they can dig a little deeper if they want to look at some of the documentaries um, that are available on YouTube that I, I saw that you're a part of. Um, and yeah, I'll give you maybe a chance if you just want to give maybe some parting wisdom to the classes and then we'll, we'll sign off for today. Hey, the most important thing, whatever you pick, it pick something that you have fun doing and just do it, do it well, but make sure you enjoy it. Don't let anyone else tell you what to do. All right, amazing advice. So I'm going to turn on the microphones, give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you, and uh, we'll sign off for today. So thanks so much. Bye, thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. All right, we're officially signed.